Hello, I'm Kate Jabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. It's 20 years since Britain sent troops into Iraq on a mission to eradicate weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist. We thought we were saving the Iraqi people from the barbaric clutches of Saddam and his regime. And we quickly realised that actually we were seen as an occupying force. The war fighting was over in weeks, but the bloody insurgency and all that followed still echoes around the world. Whether it was for good or ill, decisions taken then have continued to shape our attitude to military interventionism. Two decades on, we assess how it shaped and changed the UK's armed forces and what we expect from them. Successive governments, yes, they were risk averse. But in future circumstances, the government should realise we are willing to take casualties in order to get the job done. A former head of the army shares his thoughts on what we got wrong and right. A veteran of the conflict tells us why he now lives in the country where he was ambushed and shot. And Professor of Defence Studies Michael Clark will explain the lessons and whether we've learned them. Mike, for some who are serving today, they weren't even born when the Iraq war started. For some of us, it feels unbelievable. It's as much as 20 years ago. How large does Iraq loom in all your years as a defence analyst? Oh, Iraq comes up all the time, particularly talking about the credibility of the Western world here in the the war in Ukraine against uh, Russia. Um, All the time when the West is trying to pull supporters together elsewhere, Iraq comes up. And the damage that that, the image of Iraq has done uh, is something we're still living with. Well, Britain's part in the Iraq war was called Operation Telic. It lasted six years, claimed 179 British lives, left a lasting toll on many more and cost the UK over half a billion pounds. It has a complicated legacy. And to understand that fully, we need to know what Iraq is like today. Retired Major Chris Hunter, who served as a bomb disposal operator on Optelic, now lives in the north of Iraq, where he works for the charity FSD, clearing improvised bombs left by the Islamic State terror group. Everywhere you look, you see signs of progress. Businesses are flourishing, children are at school. There's a sense of hope, but there's also a sense of uncertainty as well, because they're always concerned about the next war, the next conflict, the next person who's going to try and fill the power vacuum. So I I always think of Iraq as as very much a land of contrast, Kate. And you are speaking to me from Erbil. Uh, What about the rest of Iraq? Would you as a British person be able to visit outside Kurdish areas? Yes, so we um, live in the Kurdish area of Iraq, but each day we travel into federal Iraq. Um, We have to get all sorts of permissions to do that. That's really where our core business is. Uh, Myself and my, uh, my colleagues, all of whom are former British Armed Forces, we go into federal Iraq every day and we clear explosively contaminated areas that are littered with the estimated 300,000 remaining improvised explosive devices left behind by ISIS. And how and why did you take this on? Well, mine's a long story, and I'm not sure we've got long enough to uh, to give you the long (laughs) version, but I think effectively 20 years ago, like most of the young, um, naive members of the British Armed Forces, we followed our orders. We were going to uh, to war. We were sold a lie about the weapons of mass destruction. We soon realised, I think, that that wasn't the case. But I think everybody tried to make a positive difference to the lives of the Iraqi people. The conflicts that the British Armed Forces have been involved in have almost always had the support of the British people and usually international law. Um, but I think this conflict was our Vietnam in many ways, you know. It didn't have the support of the, uh, the population. So I suppose there was, a, you know, in parts, there was wanting to try and make a difference and to try and put it right. And my colleagues and I, you know, we were blessed with a skill set that enabled us to come back out to Iraq and actually help the Iraqi people to, you know, live better lives and ultimately a safer life. And turning that clock back 20 years, can you just describe what it was like? Because it was pretty brutal, wasn't it? I was actually commanding a specialist airborne bomb disposal unit a couple of weeks before the war started. We were given a warning order and told we were going to be parachuting into a divisional sized Iraqi position and we were going to be parachuting under fire. Hence, it was known operating certain death. For some reason, it was cancelled at the very last minute. So I didn't go in for another year. I went in in 2004. But even then, I'd been attached to the special forces for four years. So, you know, I was a fairly sort of adept soldier. But I don't think anything really prepared us for for what we saw and and what we experienced. And, And certainly four days into my own tour, my team and I were ambushed on the way back from dealing with some improvised explosive devices. Um, my number two was shot. I was shot. 
it was, you know, it was, un, it was unreal. It was the most surreal thing, the most terrifying experience as well. I think I've ever experienced during my entire armed forces career and afterwards. I think what was more terrifying was that we had to actually go back out the next day. So I got a, I got hit in the leg. Dan, my number two, got hit in the shoulder. A bullet ricocheted off the inside of the vehicle and went into his shoulder. Um, but we were both fit to fight the next day. We got a tasking the next day and we had to drive through the ambush area, which was really surreal um, and unnerving in equal measure. And I think after that, you know, we were very much hearts and minds you know, almost the hippies of the military, if you like, in terms of being bomb disposal. You know, we were lovers, not fighters, I guess, to, to be a bit coy there. But I think the switch changed. You know, we didn't trust anybody at that point. We started looking at everybody as a hostile. Yeah, it was a real baptism of fire, I think. And, uh, you know, it was a relentless tour. And when you think about what you and your colleagues endured then, the 179 British lives lost, the many more devastated. Do you see in Iraq today anything good that's come out of it? I think... Probably the best thing that's come out of it, I see lots of good, uh, is the short answer, Kate, but I think the best thing that's come out of it, when we went in in 2003, we thought we were saving the Iraqi people from the barbaric clutches of Saddam and his regime. And we quickly realised that actually we were seen as an occupying force. Even the people that sort of came across as being friendly were always very cautious of us. Now it's an entirely different story. We're welcome with open arms. We're welcome into their houses. There are people that, you know, I work with that were from the Basra area when I was there that were potentially, you know, incredibly hostile towards the British Armed Forces, some of whom may have even been in the ambush that, you know, that, that targeted my, my colleagues and I. And we're actually really close friends now. We work together and, you know, we're not just work colleagues, we're mates. We get on really, really well. And Chris, you work with a team who are all ex-military. How many of them are Iraq veterans? Probably all of us are Iraq veterans at one stage or another. And probably half of them were actually there in 2003 and went in with the main sort of force. So, um, you know, we all have an affinity with Iraq. And, and interestingly, you know, we, we don't just train the miners, we train operators as well. So, we, you know, we're trying to train guys to be at the same level of knowledge and expertise as us, the local nationals and the internationals. We're very much equals. And how much do you actually talk about your experiences of the Iraq war? With the, with the local nationals? or No, with, with the people you work, the ex-military people you work with. Yeah, well, I think, actually both, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. When we, when we talk to the Iraqis, that's when it's most interesting because uh, they were on one side or the other. They were pro-Saddam or anti-Saddam. When life's good, they're, uh, they're really happy. When life's bad or, uh, you know, there's a few politi- bit of political turmoil or you know, there's some sort of issue, protest, whatever, then they always say it was better under Saddam, you know. Um, it changes from week to week. I mean, we're obviously a little bit diplomatic when we talk to them about our experiences. It's... Almost done in a in a you know a banter type way. We joke about things rather than sort of get too heavy and deep about it. And it's the same, I think, with the you know my international colleagues, the uh, the guys that are in the British forces. And Chris, how how do Iraqis uh, respond to you? Given the fact that when you were deployed to Iraq, you had no choice during the war, and now you've chosen to come to Iraq now that you're a veteran. I think half of them think we're bonkers, <laughs> and then uh, the, the, no, the majority of them, I think, they really appreciate it. You know, it's a, a very gratifying existence. I work for an aid organization now, don't get paid a great deal of money, but I don't think I've ever been as rich as a human being. My, my, my wife always says, you know, do you want to contribute towards the problem or the solution? So at least out here, we're contributing towards a solution, I think. Major Chris Hunter talking to me from Erbil. Uh, Mike, the bombs that Chris is clearing were mostly left by the Islamic State terror group. Do the countries that invaded Iraq 20 years ago bear responsibility for the rise of IS and its years terrorising Iraq? Or, or is it more complicated than that? Yes, of course, it, it's, it is more complicated. And, you know, I, I've met a lot of people like Chris Hunter. I've met people, service personnel who served in Bosnia and then went back to Bosnia as civilians to make a difference. And service personnel mm. who served in Afghanistan went back to Afghanistan to make a difference. And he said something there which is very indicative, I think. He said he talked about the power vacuum. And that's it. The incompetence of the civilian part of the Iraq war, stage four political reconstruction, and fatally, the Americans, but the Bush administration took that away from the State Department and gave it to the Pentagon, and the Pentagon just didn't want to do it. 
Tommy Franks, who was in charge, said, well, it's not my problem. Stage four, that's for civilians. And so it created, of course, a power vacuum. And it was into that vacuum that Islamic State developed. And a lot of those early Islamic State people, particularly the organizers, were actually ex-Iraqi army Sunnis who felt completely uh, excluded from this new sectarian state that was filling the vacuum that Chris Hunter talked about. And of course, Mike, the rise of IS led to the return of British forces to Iraq as military trainers and the RAF's Operation Shader, which is still happening, but nowhere like the intensity it once was at. IS is not eradicated, though, is it? No, it certainly isn't. They're in uh, Afghanistan, operating quite uh, strongly in the northeast of Afghanistan. They're involved in Libya. They're involved in the area of uh, Sinai. And they're uh, putting some sort of links into um, sub-Saharan Africa. So IS, a bit like Al-Qaeda itself, is now decentralised and is working in four or five different places for the same sort of radical jihadist purposes. Mike, like, stay with us. Well, when the US-led coalition went into Iraq 20 years ago, President Bush declared the major military combat operation was over after just 41 days. He made that speech in front of a banner stating, mission accomplished. For British troops in the South, the job changed at that point from war fighting to stabilisation and peacekeeping, their mission repeatedly defined by just three words. My job out here is basically the looking after the hearts and minds. This is all good for the hearts and minds process. So what we're finding we're having to do is get into the hearts and minds of people within their own villages. The hearts and minds strategy had its roots in Malaya in the 1950s. The British commander there, Field Marshal Sir Gerald Templer, said the shooting side of this business is only 25% of the trouble and the other 75 lies in getting the people of this country behind us. Well, with us now is Paul Condon, who has been exploring that hearts and minds strategy in Iraq for a New Forces news documentary. Uh, Paul, what was the hearts and minds strategy and how did it work? Hi, Kate. You're essentially trying to win their hearts and minds for supporting your intervention. Really think about their public welfare. Think about providing food and water and electricity, also providing law and order. In Iraq, essentially that meant as soon as coalition forces prevailed, the British troops had to provide support for a large population, Basra, of which they were now responsible for. Initially, they were probably a little bit suspect because, you know, you've got strange, strangers, foreigners coming in with guns and weapons and everything else. But once they realised the reasons we were there to help them get water, help them with food, we had teams of medics with us, you know, so we could take medics around. Once they realised that we were there to help them, they, you know, I think they welcomed us. That was Staff Sergeant Darren Madden of 12th Regiment Royal Artillery. His particular battery were responsible for air defence, but with the Iraqi army defeated and the Air Force not providing any threat, they were reassigned to Hearts and Minds role. And rather than looking, if you like, in, like intimidating soldiers, they wore berets, they didn't wear body armour, they patrolled amongst the people, they spoke with the people using interpreters. They're very much in and amongst the people, trying to win them over, trying to win their rational self-support, so that the intervention would ultimately work. And Paul, that hearts and minds strategy had its roots in the 1950s, but when applied in southern Iraq, was it tried and tested already or to some extent novel and perhaps an experiment? Well, as you say, it was, was, if you like, associated a lot with uh, the insurgency in, in Malaya in the 1950s. But British troops also brought, if you like, a hearts and minds a strategy to other interventions, both humanitarian and more military, such as Sierra Leone, Bosnia and Kosovo. So they had, if you like, had been practicing and doing it very successfully. And so by the time they went into Iraq, I think it was something that they felt quite confident about doing. Sort of to a certain extent, it was common sense. It was that there was a little bit of ad hocness about it. It was, we're British troops, this is what we do. Um, we've defeated the enemy, the people are looking to us for support and help, we're going to provide it because we're really good at this sort of thing. And Paul, we know that within a year British troops were back into regular bloody combat with insurgents and ultimately were driven out of Basra. So what went wrong? Well, a number of things went wrong. I mean, firstly, you could argue the pre-war planning, were we fully prepared for what we were about to embark on? Within a matter of months, Paul Bremer, the kind of de facto American ruler of Iraq, disbanded the Iraqi army and stopped senior members of the Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party from public service. British, large British invasion force was reduced in size, so they began to be less security, if you like. And the people 
well, think about their rational self-interest. They will look at British troops and say, are you the winners? Are, are we back in the right side here? And things began to turn. Uh, there were, you had the episodes of Baha Musa, who was a young man who was killed in British custody. And you had the American prison scandal in Abu Ghraib, where prisoners were abused. So things started to go against the British reasonably quickly. Sooner or later, you have to ask, is this working? How long do you give it? Colonel Tim Collins, who was the commanding officer of the 1st Battalion of the Royal Irish Regiment, gave a stirring speech to his forces on the eve of invasion, as we all remember, and he implored them to respect the Iraqi population and civilians. You know, he argues that you have to give this time. You cannot just cut your losses and leave. The timing of the hearts and minds is a bit like penicillin. You've got to finish your course of penicillin. If you stop halfway through, the illness comes back resistant to penicillin, and then you've got a real problem. Hearts and minds are the same. When you go in initially, you've got to grip it, and you've got to stay in grip it until the problem has gone away. If you stop halfway through, withdraw the barracks, you have no control of what's happening. And Paul, has that experience consigned hearts and minds to history as a strategy, or does it still have a place in British military thinking and operations? Uh, no, I say it still has its place, and it always forms part of our counterinsurgency strategy. And it's very much part of a soldier's DNA. We, we spoke to Lieutenant General Sir Graham Lamb, who led British forces uh, in Basra in 2003, and was also the Deputy Commander of Coalition Forces uh, in Iraq later. He would argue, and does argue, it's central to who a British military personnel person is. Actually, the truth is, hearts and minds, or that sense of will, reason why, actually underpins everything I ever did in uniform. My favourite line in any poem uh, is Ulysses, which merely says, you know, I am a part of all that I have met. We are the sum of all my experiences, good, bad, and thoroughly ugly. And so the truth about it is, you know, we need to be human. We need to have that humanity to try and make things better. I approached the British Army about this, and they, was, they say that population-centric, if you like, that's the, the sort of more academic way to describe it, is very much part of their philosophy, and cadets are taught the importance of population-centric counterinsurgency. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. And you can watch Paul's film, Hearts and Minds, A Very British Tactic, on the Forces News YouTube channel now. Uh, Mike, it struck me that the British approach 20 years ago to aim to be seen as liberators rather than invaders, it did work for a while. One year ago, it failed spectacularly for President Putin when he told his forces they'd be welcomed into Ukraine. Yes, and I mean, his intelligence failure on what the situation in Ukraine was, the, the attitude of Ukrainians towards Russians, actually makes Western intelligence failures in Afghanistan and Iraq just look like a bit of Western inattention. And the point is, there's a sort of golden hour in these things, just like after an accident, there's a golden hour where you can save somebody's life. In these situations, there's a sort of golden year or a golden 18 months where you can win the, 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 the process. And... Um, that lasted in Afghanistan until uh, effectively 2002, 2003, and it lasted in Iraq until about 2004. And we wasted it. In both cases, we wasted the golden hour when it could have worked. Yeah, because it did work for a matter of months in Iraq, but it looks like, you know, we did squander the golden hour. So what, do, what does that say about the hearts and minds strategy? Does it just mean get on with it or is it discredited? Was it just a hard lesson and, and we need to use it properly? Yeah, I, well, I think, again, as, as Graham Lamb said, it's, it's intrinsic um, to what the British Army always does. There's always a hearts and minds element in any military operation because ultimately military operations are about securing control or securing territory in somewhere where people live. And that does require the military to to shade into the civilian area uh, much more than it does. And most importantly, civilian agencies have got to take issues on. The, the problem with the military is that when it goes into an operation, it ends up doing all the civilian jobs as well, which is not very good at doing usually. And the, and the, the civilians stand back and say, well, the military does that. The civilian agencies have got to come in much, much more. That's the essence of the problem.
Well, the hearts and minds is just one of the many, many areas where lessons can be learned from the Iraq war. What happened 20 years ago is indelibly etched into British military history. So how has it affected and shaped the UK's armed forces today? General Lord Dannett led some of the final planning for the war as commander of the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, the ARC, and was the chief of the general staff who oversaw the end of Optelic. Well, there's no doubt that the campaign in Iraq, and of course, we can't ignore the campaign in Afghanistan that was going on at the same time, put huge pressure uh, on the British armed forces, and particularly uh, on our land forces. Through the intensity of both those campaigns, they gave tremendous experience and leadership, improving skills that has had a measurable effect uh, on our land forces subsequently. Now, 20 years on, there's almost another generation of soldiers now, but you can't get away from the experience that was gained and therefore the professionalism that was improved as a result of those extended and very difficult uh, campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. And where tangibly can you see that experience and the lessons of Iraq in British military thinking and doctrine today? Well, of course, things, uh, things have changed. Both the campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan were counterinsurgencies, okay? Initially, uh, when we went into Basra in 2003, there was a war fighting phase, and then we believed that it was more of a peacekeeping phase, but it, the situation quite quickly deteriorated, and it became a very gritty campaign, culminating uh, in the fighting around Basra Palace. Now, those campaigns have ended, and although we need to maintain the skills and the understanding of how to conduct counterinsurgency operations, and what we've seen in the last year with the vicious war going on in Ukraine is that more conventional land maneuver capabilities are also required. And that's a challenge for the army at the present moment. So I think the thing people have to understand, because you can't tell the future with any great clarity, an army has to be prepared to operate in a very wide range of, of, of ways. And that's expensive. Um, and that's what the government and the Treasury has to get its head round. 20 years ago, kit was very much an issue. There were hard lessons learned early on with things like snatched Land Rovers, smaller items, the fabled melting boots, not enough body armour for everyone in the early weeks. Do you think we really learned from those experiences? Well, I hope we've learned from those experiences, but let's just remember how that all came about. The politics was such that Tony Blair did not want to signal to the British people that his decision had already been taken, that we, the British forces, were going to get involved with the Americans. And that meant orders could not be placed, industry couldn't be fired up, the right levels of equipment couldn't be ordered and put in place. So we had to use the equipment that we've got, many of which was not suitable. And it took quite some time and a lot of argument and discussion with the government of the day. And it was a very grueling time both for the soldiers on the ground and for those of us in senior positions arguing the case in the Ministry of Defence. Iraq radically changed public perception of the armed forces and that influences politicians, obviously. Do we treat our servicemen and women better now because of the war? Uh, yes and, and no. I think at the early stage of the war, bearing in mind the decision to go to war was a very unpopular one, in the public mind, our military were also placed in the unpopular corner as well, along with the government. But if you remember back in 2006, 2007, 2008, there was quite a transformation of the popular understanding about soldiers. And we started to see homecoming parades. We saw sometimes thousands of people on the on the streets of, of our cities. Uh, we saw Help for Heroes, for example, starting, and the service charities getting much more support. So there was a real groundswell of support for our military. Criticism of the government, but support for the military. But, but did that public support translate into better government support? Well, it comes and goes. It is uh, often said that governments take the view that there are no votes or there are very few votes uh, in defence. And that's the sort of toss up the government has got to make. Where do they put their priorities? Where do they spend their money? You said at the time of, of the Iraq war that you thought the politicians making the decisions didn't get it. Do you think politicians do get it better now because of Iraq? I would like to think so. Uh, it's You'd a, like to, or you're not sure then? <laughs> well, uh, if I was sure, 
we wouldn't be having the conversations that we're having now, trying to make the case for increased expenditure, particularly on our land forces. And overall, the experience of Iraq, has it made us as a nation more risk averse in a way that affects how we use our forces? Well, we certainly saw that successive governments. Yes, they were risk averse. I think the pictures of uh, flag draped coffins of, of our dead colleagues returning through Royal Whitton Bassett had quite an effect on, on the public attitude. Yes, of course, but it also had quite an effect on, on the government. That's understandable, but in future circumstances, the government should realise that the British public and the British armed forces are resolute. And if the cause is right, we are willing to take casualties in order to get the job done. And what would you say to new servicemen or women of today who might not have been born at the start of Optelic? What is the legacy for them in the work they do today? I think they should always, as we've always done in the British Armed Forces, look back over our shoulder and do so with pride. We can see that our former colleagues, the generations before us, did their duty extremely well on behalf of the nation. And that is the bedrock foundation of our motivation to tackle whatever comes along uh, in the future. Lord Dannett, great to speak to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Kate. Mike, the Chilcot Inquiry spent longer than the whole of Operation Telic trying to get to the lessons learned from the war, military, political, diplomatic. Did it succeed? Well, I think it did in terms of history. A lot of people were disappointed because it took so long and it was so big when it came out. They wanted the Chilcot Inquiry to declare that Tony Blair had acted illegally, and it didn't and it wouldn't. The, the war was not illegal, whether or not it was a, a, a good idea. And so the Chilcot Inquiry has put that into history, and it does serve in Whitehall because it's referred to a lot. The Chilcot principles against groupthink, against too much, let's call it sofa government, it's built into a lot of the, the briefs that civil servants use to say, just check that you're observing these principles because Chilcot has had an effect on the way government works when it's thinking about the political military relationship. Iraq is a huge battle scar for the UK. 20 years on, it's almost universally seen as a damning failure. Will history record anything positive from what happened, Mike? Well, it might. I mean, you know, Israel always said it's the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, that's not now true because there's a democracy in Iraq. There are elections in Iraq and it does stagger forward in in a way that just about is sustainable. And we'll see what happens there. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting that, that the whole Iraq episode, when we think back on it, it reflects on this difference between the tactical and the strategic. We've got this conundrum here where the, the modern British armed forces, they always succeed tactically but that doesn't always translate in the modern world into strategic success so in a way you can't blame the forces they do their job but then you look to the politicians and you say are you sure you've got the strategy right we'll get the tactics right the modern world the modern forces will get the tactics right have you got the strategy right Professor Michael Clark, really good to speak to you. Thank you for your time. And my thanks to all of our guests. We didn't have enough time to share the full story of Major Chris Hunter's extraordinary new life in Iraq, clearing unexploded bombs. But you can listen to it in an extra edition of the SITREP podcast, which is already online. This week, our final thoughts come from four MPs who've all served their country in Iraq. James Sunderland, Dan Jarvis, Adam Holloway and Andrew Morrison all spoke on Monday in a special Commons debate marking the 20th anniversary of the Iraq war. We'll leave you with just some of what they said. Goodbye. I can recall vividly in Basra on Talik 4 deploying into a relatively benign environment. Floppy hats and shorts open-top Land Rovers at Basra International Airport. And by word, at the end of that tour, we were deployed body armour helmets. We will all remember one simple but deadly word shouted three times. Gas, gas, gas. The signal to put on your respirator. In the intense heat and on the hot sand and often in the pitch black. We pay tribute tonight to the veterans and we remember all those who died in these wards, and especially those from our own armed forces. But we should also hope that in future, people in this House and surrounding ministries honour the risks that they take by having a proper plan for what comes next. This is the least we can promise our troops in future. 20 years on, the Iraq War remains 
deeply controversial and contested. Whether it was for good or ill, decisions taken then have continued to shape our attitude to military interventionism. Yet while we can continue to debate the politics, what is not up for discussion is the fact that the soldiers, sailors and aviators of Operation Telic at no point gave less than their all.